Thanks for tuning in for part two here, groundwater pollution. So here's a test for you. Which type of water pollution is considered harder to treat? Surface water or groundwater? Pause. All right, did you pick groundwater? If so, that is correct. So what's the deal with this? It is worse than surface water pollution because it is longer lasting. And persistent toxicants get easily washed out of rivers but remain a long time, meaning decades or more in groundwater as they break down slowly in the absence of sunlight. When we talk about persistent toxicants, we are talking about things that, persistence means how long does it stay in the environment. And sun is powerful with its UV rays, and it can break apart toxicant molecules, especially organic molecules. And, um, but in the ground, there is, not that, there is no UV. So here we see, by the way, um, a waste disposal site. If it's leaking, it's going to be contaminating the groundwater. And it's very important when you build or design a landfill that you make sure that you are not going to get groundwater pollution. And we'll visit, we'll see that in our trip coming up to the Tahegas landfill. All right, so groundwater pollution sources are both natural and anthropogenic. Natural sources would be all these things arsenic, aluminum fluoride, nitrates, and sulfates. And human sources, leaky underground storage tanks like oil, gas, industrial chemicals, septic waste. Um, if you think about maybe in a, an old um, gas station that went out of business, but maybe it left its tanks filled with oil underneath, um, you know, underneath the uh, gas dispensers, over time it can leak. Nitrates from fertilizers can leach all the way down into the groundwater. Pesticides, same thing. Pathogens from wells and feedlots can get down there. Contamination from underground hazardous waste disposal and industrial chemical waste, compounds from military sites. These are all ways that we can pollute groundwater. So, and as we mentioned, it can be natural. I just want to mention this example in India where they build thousands of wells dug by international aid workers for the benefit of Bangladesh citizens. They turned out to be poisoned with natural sources of arsenic. And uh, here you can see just the, the, the concentration of that. Some success stories, many water pollution problems have decreased since the 1960s and 1970s due to legislation. So there was the Clean Water Act of 1977 in the U.S. and similar acts in other nations. That was huge. This came, around, came along at around the time when we actually had something catastrophic happen. Uh, this is right here, Lake Erie. And um, here's Lake Erie over here. I grew up not far from there. This is Northeast Ohio. Um, and the Cuyahoga River actually caught on fire a couple of times, believe it or not, from um, so much pollution. And um, so Canadian and U.S. governments have decreased PCBs, which are really gnarly chemicals, industrial chemicals, DDE, which is kind of like DDT, and fertilizers, etc., by 70 to 90 percent. Fish and bird populations are now recovering. Good, good news. There's also the Safe Drinking Water Act of 1974, which is related. Where is this woman standing? She is standing at the Decatur um, Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is on Upper San Roque Road in the foothills. And so drinking water is treated before it reaches your tap to make sure it is not polluted, but it is easier and more cost effective to prevent pollution in the first place than to try to get rid of it. So here's a little map. Um, here's San Roque Road. If you drive up there, you go by this huge plant or if you, um, if you go along Ontario Road in the foothills, you look down on it and it's just like, what the heck is that thing? It's a huge complex. But here's where they're storing some of the water temporarily, taken in from Lake Kachuma. So wastewater treatment, this is after we've used the water. Choose the best choice. Preliminary treatment in a wastewater treatment plant involves what? This is multiple mark. So go ahead and pause. All right, if you said, Preliminary treatment involves filtering the influent sewage. That is correct. And if you, that's, that's it actually. So here's that process here. And um, oh, so we have primary treatment, which um, we, we kind of, I circled this part in the beginning here, which is preliminary treatment where you're running it through the filter. This is where you're taking out rags and things like that. 
And then it's going to that grit chamber where things are allowed to set. Like this is where the really gritty stuff comes out, like the, the corn and the coffee grinds and all that. And then it goes to the sedimentation tank where the sludge sinks and the scum floats to the top. The scum is like grease and fats and stuff like that from the kitchen. All right. And so that's part of our, that's our preliminary and primary treatment. So this should be easy now. Primary treatment in a wastewater treatment plant involves which of the following? Go ahead and pause. Okay, uh, so which ones did you pick? Did you pick B, using settling tanks? And, um, and that's it, actually, for that one. So now we go to, um, we go to secondary treatment. What is that? What is involved with that? Go ahead and pause. All right, so if you said using aeration tanks, that's true. That's where they're pumping that, all that air in to feed the microorganisms the oxygen that they need to decompose the organic matter. And then from there, it goes to um, settling tanks called the secondary clarifiers. And then, you know, before it goes back out to the ocean, they do apply chlorine. So here we have applying chlorine. And then, of course, you have to dechlorinate it. I didn't include that step. But then we have the last step here, fil um, filtering the effluent sewage. Actually, no, I, I spoke too soon. Aeration and settling tanks and chlorine. So D, B, and A. Now, tertiary treatment is where you would also run it through filters. You're filtering the effluent sewage. And this is done for the reclaimed water that they're actually going to put back out um, into golf courses, etc. They run it through some carbon filters. All right, so here's just another kind of breakdown. Preliminary treatment involves filtering large stuff. Primary treatment involves physical removal of contaminants in the primary clarifier settling, settling tanks. And then secondary treatment is where you have aerobic bacteria decomposing organic pollutants in the aeration basins, followed by secondary clarifier settling tanks. And um, here's a question for you. Which of the following is a useful byproduct of wastewater treatment plants? Multiple mark. Go ahead and pause. All right, so welcome back. If you said that biosolids are useful, that's absolutely true. They are super high in phosphates and nitrates, mostly from the, the feces and, um, and I guess you could say the decomposed food that went down the kitchen sink. But in general, manure, including human manure, is very high in, in, um, in, in uh, nutrients. Okay, and then of course, if you said methane, that's correct. They're getting that methane by putting the sludge and the scum into the anaerobic digesters and letting those anaerobic bacteria break it down. And those bacteria, they don't give off CO2 like aerobic bacteria do. They give off methane, which is CH4. And it's useful because we can burn it as fuel and use it to make electricity. Uh, or they're talking also about burning that methane to heat up water, to heat up the, the effluent water. So rather than applying chlorine, they're thinking of burning the methane to boil the water to kill off the pathogens before it goes into the ocean. Pretty awesome. And uh, what's another useful byproduct? Reclaimed water, right? Water that they are now sending out to golf courses and other places for irrigation. Salt is a byproduct of that dechlorination process, but it's not really a useful byproduct. And of course, gold, um, pretty awesome. Uh, it could be a byproduct for you if you get lucky and see it coming into that grit chamber. Or I guess it'd be the grit chamber or the um, that first filter. Okay, so here's just a picture of the treatment process. Um, don't just say too much about it. We've already discussed, discussed it. But here are those aeration basins right there. Natural treatment, this is an interesting example up in Arcata they were having to bump up the ability of their wastewater treatment plant to process water. And so it was going to be very expensive for them to put in um, the secondary treatment process that was being required by code. And so they actually um, worked out that they could use a local wetland, or actually, sorry, they created an artificial wetland. And, um, and so the water from the primary treatment now goes into this artificial wetland for natural secondary treatment. So the only thing that's really different here compared to what we saw at El Estero is we're not pumping oxygen into the system. So obviously it's going to happen more slowly here, but as long as you have a big enough wetland, it doesn't matter. It'll come in at some rate, get processed, and go out. Um, it'll spend enough time in here to break down before the water flows out. 
Uh, in homes that are not on sewer systems, they use septic tanks. Like my house has a septic tank, and you can see the diagram here. You have your fixtures, like your toilets and whatnot, going to your tank, which is like maybe like a 3,000 gallon tank or something like that, sitting in the ground. And you can see here the sludge is settling down, scum is floating on top, and as new water comes in, it displaces the old water, so now that water goes out to what we call the leach field or drain field. And it's like a perforated pipe where the water slowly um, uh, percolates through the soil. And in that process, it's being further treated by bacteria to break down the, the nasty stuff. Um, every once in a while, you have to get your septic tank pumped because this stuff, this sludge will... Um, could pile up. In an ideal case, you have such good active bacteria that they're able to decompose the sludge and, and flow out on their own into the leach field and then, you know, who knows what. But in most cases, you do need to pump out this stuff. It's really important that you buy, say, toilet paper that's um, compatible with septic tanks so that it can break down and not just pile up. All right. Um, so septic, what does that mean? This is kind of a breakdown here. Septic means infected or rotting. If they talk about having a wound that is septic, that's bad. Okay, you got to get some antibiotics on that right away. But um, here we're just talking about waste that sits for a while in the tank where it settles. We're talking about microbial decomposers digesting the organic matter, and then that clarified water goes through pipes to the leach field where it percolates away. It differs from wastewater treatment plants in these three ways. There is no preliminary filter step. There's no aeration process. Septic means low oxygen generally, um, or usually it's associated with low oxygen, and effluent discharge to the soil rather than to waterways. Um, yeah, I, don't quote me on this. Septic equals low oxygen. I had this. Yeah. Anyways, don't quote me on that. But a local town, here's a little quiz for you. A local town releases insufficiently treated wastewater plant effluent into the local stream. Where would you expect DO of the river water to be the lowest? This is multiple choice. Go ahead and pause and make your choice. All right, welcome back. Did you pick D? That is the correct answer. Oh, sorry. No, let me back up. The correct answer is C, one mile past the point of discharge. So this goes back to the idea of DO SAG where your organic discharge is happening right here and so you get this decomposition zone as the bacteria are breaking it down it is using up oxygen and uh, so we have two things here here's the oxygen level being shown and this is where it's at its lowest this is what we would call the septic zone and then you can see the organic dis discharge is being consumed being consumed consumed finally it's pretty much consumed and at that point there the oxygen can begin to recover um, as plants do photosynthesis and put that O2 back into the water. Also, we have oxygen coming in from the surface of the water, making this DO increase. And we especially have that happening when you have rapidly flowing water, where as it's flowing, it kind of stirs up a little bit. And then you eventually get back to a clean zone. So this would be like the 10 miles further downstream. This would be like the one mile downstream. Okay. So if you're a fish, you're going to be happy in the clean zones. You're going to be really not happy in the septic zone. You're going to be getting very unhappy in decomposition and 